Thank you so much as always for watching, and if you like this... Oh shit. License to Kill stars Timothy Dalton as James Bond. It was his second appearance after The Living Daylights and it ended up being his final appearance in the role. So when a drug lord that Bond and Felix both capture in the opening scene escapes, he finds Felix and brutally murders his wife and leaves Felix for dead. So Bond goes rogue and seeks vengeance on those responsible as he infiltrates an organization posing as a hitman. Timothy Dalton is a Bond you don't hear as much about as some of the other actors. He only did two films between The Living Daylights and License to Kill, but in my opinion, he was one of the best to ever wear the suit. He was kind of a precursor to Daniel Craig's Bond. And although the public wasn't exactly in love with Roger Moore at first in his early films, and were perhaps clamoring for Sean Connery to return once again, his films eventually caught on to the public and he made a lot of Bond movies and they were successful financially. But they were also very silly, lighthearted films. Timothy Dalton's portrayal of Bond was much more in line with Ian Fleming's original vision for this character, a cold-blooded assassin. There's two million dollars in that suitcase. I'll split it with you. You want it. You keep it, old buddy. No! And I don't know if the public was quite ready for that, because License to Kill was the very first PG-13 Bond. This movie has brutal kills. People are eaten alive by sharks. The main villain, Sanchez, is a ruthless Colombian drug lord who murders people in very violent ways. Even if you're on his side and you disappoint him, he just might put you in a pressure chamber and explode your head. The Bond films that directly preceded Living Daylights and License to Kill felt very frivolous in nature compared to this movie. This movie feels like there's actual stakes. It feels like there's real danger. There's moments where James is in these horrific scenarios that you expect him to get out at the last second, but there are times in this movie where you're not exactly sure if that's gonna happen. Despite how much I enjoy the James Bond movies, he doesn't usually feel like a human being. Daniel Craig's Bond changed that with Casino Royale, and some of the better moments in Pierce Brosnan's filmography addressed certain things that other films haven't. But for the most part, most of the Bond films up until Timothy Dalton were fun action movies you could go to with your date and eat popcorn and, and not really care. There might be a laser coming for Bond's crotch, but you know he's gonna get out of there. License to Kill doesn't feel that way. This movie feels like when people die, they just fucking die. <laughs> No one's gonna get up after they're crushed by a tanker truck. At the time, this was easily the most violent James Bond movie. And we're not used to seeing Bond like this. His friend killed, his other friend maimed. Throughout the movie, other people he's close to are murdered. And it takes a toll on him. You can tell that it's eating him apart inside. This revenge path that he's on is turning him into a different person and you can't tell if he's comfortable with that or not. There's a lot of nuance to Bond in this movie. And I never really paid attention to his portrayal of Bond for a long time until I watched all of the films in a row. And I could see just how much he brought to this role and just how much he was really trying to revolutionize his portrayal of this character. It doesn't feel like anything else that had come before it. And I just don't think the public was ready for it yet. This film also took M and MI6 and Bond's relationship with them in a new direction. Because once they can tell that he's a loose cannon, they force him into a meetup and revoke his license to kill. And when he flees the scene and goes rogue, it makes it feel like there's real consequences here. It doesn't feel like everything's going to be okay. We're gonna talk about the ending of the movie and get into some spoilers just to warn you and why I wish they had committed to that during the finale. And before Benicio Del Toro was shoving his balls in people's faces to intimidate them, he was a villain in License to Kill. And he's very intimidating whenever he's on screen. You can definitely see the talent waiting to blossom. The action sequences here also feel more brutal even than the last film, Living Daylights. That film was rated PG and it still felt kind of safe and like an acceptable adventure your family could see. This movie threw all of that away, and it's one of the lowest grossing James Bond films. Not a lot of people saw this one. Now, even though this film is considerably more serious and takes a harder edge than the previous, unfortunately, towards the end, it throws all that away. Bond gets a phone call from Felix. Felix is fine. 
He's like, hey, everything is cool. Hey, M wants to talk to you about a job. And he's like, eh, whatever, hangs up. And he goes and makes out with a girl. I'm like, really? I mean, like, there's no consequences? This movie felt like it was setting up a world in which there were dire consequences. And for most of the film, it backs that up. Until the ending. It kind of just, we we're supposed to leave and smile and have fun. And it was a James Bond movie. Yay. It didn't mean anything. That is unfortunate because this film was kind of poised for potential greatness and in some ways even the filmmakers weren't quite ready for that yet. Still, I think this is a very good James Bond film. I think it's very underrated as is Dalton's portrayal of the character. But I do want to talk about the finale tanker chase. This is a sequence that has a lot of crazy stunts. Some things happen that just don't really feel real like the truck like just does a fucking wheelie all of a sudden. I don't I'm not exactly sure why that happened. Yeah, the stunt is practical, but why the fuck does the truck have the ability to do that? That's the question. But what I really want to talk about is the urban legend that surrounds this scene. If you don't know about it, supposedly nuns in a minibus went off a cliff and died on this stretch of road. And the crew, while filming this sequence, was plagued with a lot of strange events. One of the missiles that Sanchez fires apparently traveled a couple miles and hit somebody. Timothy Dalton was almost killed during one of the truck stunts. And the strangest thing by far, and one of the creepiest things, is the explosion that occurs at the end. This really epic scene where Bond takes the lighter that Felix gave him and lights Sanchez on fire and he fucking burns alive. Really dark stuff. Love it. Then the tanker truck blows up. Now, there was a photographer on set that day, and he took this picture that seems to show a hand coming out of the fire. When you watch the movie and you see the explosion, you can't really find that image anywhere when you go frame by frame. So there's a lot of urban legends surrounding this finale tanker chase sequence and the stretch of road that they shot it on. And that's the kind of stuff that I just I love looking into that. That's very creepy to me. I think that's really cool. If you haven't seen Timothy Dalton's two Bond films, I would recommend them. I think this film is better. A lot of people like Living Daylights more, but I've always appreciated License to Kill a lot more. I'm gonna give it a B plus. Guys, thank you so much as always for watching. I had a good time talking about these James Bond movies. I'm gonna have a link in a second for the playlist. You can watch all the ones I've done so far. You guys are the best. I'm looking forward to seeing that movie later this year. I hope it's good. Thank you so much as always for watching. And if you like this, you can click right here and get stuckmanized.